Yeah. I thank the Lord for the beautiful music in our church. Sunday after Sunday, I praise him for it. And thank you again today. If you have your copy of God's Word, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 14 and also Luke chapter 18. These are the parables that Jesus told while on the way to Jerusalem, determined to get there to die for your sins and mine and come out of his grave and ascend to heaven. And he told these stories on the way as he was getting there. And today we look at life's living lesson about how to gain the approval of people and of God. In Luke chapter 2, the very last verse tells us everything we know about the life of Jesus between the age of 12 and 30. It says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And now at this very crucial time in his life, he is teaching about how to gain the approval of God and man. Should be very, very important to us. He tells these stories. The first is found in Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 7. Now I want you to know that I recognize the fact that we used this as part of the text two weeks ago. It's not going to be the same sermon. I do have my senior moments. I have not had a senior fortnight yet. <laughs> And so this, this is something entirely different. The Word of God is layer after layer after layer of truth. You peel back one truth, there's another and another and another. And the truth we see in this parable today in, in, in Luke 14, 7 through 11 is that God shows us how to gain favor with people. When he noticed how the guest picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this man your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And then in Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 9, he talks about how to gain favor with God. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. There is a common denominator in gaining the approval of people and gaining the approval of God. In one of these parables, the Lord is speaking about how to gain the approval of people, how to find favor with other people. And he closes by saying, For I say unto you that everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And when he talks about gaining approval with God, he said, I say unto you, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now this is an action. Uh, this is not devotionalizing. These are not some little appropriate words to say on Sunday morning when people come together around the Bible. These are actions. This is not a road map that Christ is presenting here. He says you're already on the road. This is not a recipe. He says you're already cooking what you're cooking for your life. This is already happening, and you need to make adjustments if you need to, but this is not some kind of philosophical discussion. Uh, this is about life. And the road you're on will take you where you're going to get. If you get where you're going, where are you going to be? He said, you're going to have to eat what you cooked, 
What are you putting into the broth for your life now? This is, this is the road that you're on. This is the thing that you're doing. You need to humble yourself. You need to exalt yourself, you think. The Bible tells us that if you really want to be exalted, you humble yourself. If you really want to be humbled and brought low, then you exalt yourself. But these are actions you do. This is not something you think about or look at. It says this is an action of life. While you're traveling on life's road right now, while you're cooking your food of life, you're going to have to eat what you cook. You're going to have to be where you're going. And so this, he is saying, there is a thing you need to know. He who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. You can be humble and become exalted or you can be able or wanting to exalt yourself and you will become humble that's the promise that he has for it. this is his map the, the word of God shows us ourselves remember how the Bible in James says the word is a mirror of the soul we look in there and we see ourselves and here the word of God is showing us something very very vital in learning to be who we really are Calvin Miller tells about a hospital in Kansas that had on the wall a Shakespearean quote. It's from Hamlet, uh, uh, Act 3, I think, fourth passage, where Hamlet is putting the play together to show his parents what evil and vile people they are. He gets his mother Gertrude. He literally pushes her into a chair and says, Come, come, sit you here, and I will show you, I will set up a glass to show you the inmost part of yourself. That's a great line for an x-ray waiting room, isn't it? Come, come, sit you here, budge you not, do not move from here while I set up a glass to show you the inmost part of yourself. God's Word shows us the inmost part of ourselves and calls us to face that and to make the adjustments that are necessary to make life good. The Bible is not fireworks set off just so you can hear the noise the word of God is more like a gun if you please and every time you read the word of God expect to see the game fall expect to see some foul thing shot out of your heart it is in this kind of spirit it is in this kind of teaching that Jesus is saying I'm wanting to show you how you can gain favor with God how you can gain favor with people this is very very important living lesson number one exalt yourself and you will be humbled in the in the book of Acts in the history of the church we read about Herod now some people were needing a favor from Herod he's in a position of, of greatness so they asked him to make a speech and they acted in such a way as to make sure that he knew how much he was appreciated. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. And they shouted, This is the voice of a God and not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down and he was eaten by worms and died. But I can't resist sharing the next line. But the Word of God continued to increase and spread. The Word is saying you try to exalt yourself and you will be humbled. It is true of Caesar. It is true of, of Nero, of Herod, of Napoleon. It is true that everyone who tries to exalt himself will one day find their Waterloo because this is not the way life really works. Many times this exalting ourselves is a religious practice. Many times it's done in the name of God, trying to exalt ourselves with our ministries or trying to exalt ourselves with our positions or exalt ourselves by letting other people see how righteous we are. Uh, this is often a religious thing, like it was in the case of the man who went before the throne and said, I thank you I'm not like other people. I thank you that I'm not like that. I do this, I do that. He, the Bible says he prayed about himself to God. Well, God already knows. You don't have to tell him about yourself. He knows, and he, he's telling you, if you humble yourself, if you don't humble yourself, you will not be exalted. Religious practice. And this sometimes is an impressive action. Some of the most impressive things that are done are done for self-exaltation. Some of the most impressive things that are... When, 
When I was a, a little boy, we raised chickens. Now, we called it raising chickens when you have real chickens running around in the yard in the, in the coop. Uh, did you ever, did your family ever raise chickens? You know, back in those days, if we wanted, if we wanted a, a chicken dinner, we started with a live chicken. You know, nowadays you go to the store and you see those pitiful little chickens. They've been stripped naked. And they're, they've got chill bumps all over them. <laughs> they're in this cold place. They're wrapped up in cellophane. And you're almost embarrassed for them. It's uh, Well, I, I can remember looking and studying the chickens. We, we had chickens for just a little while. We had them until the foxes found out that we had them. Now, the foxes is not the family name of the people next door. They're those little four-legged creatures who live a, on a very healthy diet of raw chicken. And so until the foxes got all of our chickens, we had chickens. And I, and I remember we did several things. We would go into that compound, that chicken wire compound where they were held prisoners, and would do several things. We would bring them food and water, and they seemed to like that. Or we would steal their eggs, and they didn't seem to like that. But when we didn't go to where the food and water was usually scattered and thrown and, and, and filled in the container, and when we didn't go into the coop where the nests were, we went toward the chickens. And that meant we were about to murder them. And, and those chickens seemed to get a foreboding look in their eyes. I, I really think that if they could have, they would have crossed themselves. <laughs> now, I was about five or four years old. My, my mother was the executioner in our family. And remember how you used to kill chickens? You would wring their necks. She'd grab them by the head and twirl them around and around and around until the head was separated from the body. Now, I'll have to admit, as a five-year-old, that was my favorite part. <laughs> Have you ever seen a chicken with his head separated from his body? They do marvelous things. <laughs> they do things they could never have done when they were in a better state of health. I think a lot of activity, maybe in church and in life I know, a lot of activity is like that. It's people who have lost their head and are doing those things that cause their own kind of death. It's the activity of death. It's the activity of death. I have a little yellow book. I meant to bring it with you. It's an extremely yellow book. And it's written in 1972 by J.D. Gray. I know John and Alice know J.D. Gray real well. He was their pastor. He wrote a book for preachers entitled Epitaph for Eager Preachers. And it's the, it's the, the theme of it is these are things written on the tombstones of dead ministries. And the first chapter is he died climbing. And he, his halo was too tight is a number of chapter. He hugged himself to death is, a, is another name of the chapter. Talking about things that can cause us to lose our ministries and get caught. It's simply saying, exalt yourself and you will be humbled. You will be brought down. That's God's lesson to us. Exalt yourself and you will be humbled. The next statement is, humble yourself and you will be exalted. Humble yourself and you will be exalted. Humility is the first step toward every major blessing of God. What's the first step toward salvation? It's humility. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. We read over and over again in the Word of God in many places. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. It's the first step toward having real Christian fellowship. All of us recognize that the world will be reached, according to Jesus, in direct proportion to how much Christians love each other. And the Word says in Romans 12 and verse 10, it says that we are to, in honor, prefer one another. We are to love each other and in honor prefer one another. We humble ourselves before each other. We count each other better than ourselves because that's the way Christian fellowship grows. It's the first step toward great Christian fellowship. Humility is the first large step toward revival. I know there are many people in our church now who are praying for revival. We're having spiritual dearth all over our land. Our own denomination has been plateaued since 1950. There is not, there's a great need for revival. There's a great need for God to bring fresh winds and fresh fire upon our fellowship. And many are praying that the first step toward that is humility. If my people, Jesus, or God told Solomon that night, remember Solomon had dedicated that temple, an $8 billion building, some say, 
and they had dedicated that thing and they'd had a wonderful day and, and that night when Solomon was by himself, God came to him and said, Solomon, the building is all right, but it's the people that are important to me. And when the people become cold in their hearts, when the people become proud and vain, when the people become self-assertive, when the people become away from me, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The first giant step toward revival is humility. God uses people who are humble. Moses, says Numbers 12, 3, Moses was the most humble man in the land of his day. The word says that Moses was a very humble man. In fact, he was more humble than any other man and any other person in the land. Then Moses was gone. How did they choose his successor? Now, I'm sure that after Moses was gone and disappeared and and was no longer there to lead. The people said, we've got to have a leader. And, uh, and maybe if they had gotten a headhunter to do this, they would have narrowed it down to two people, two great elder statesmen, Joshua and Caleb. And uh, you and I would, would make that decision easily. Here was Joshua, kind of a meek guy, uh, not self-assertive. And here was Caleb. What a man. What a man he was. We read in the 14th chapter of Joshua that Caleb said, Lord, I am just as strong now as I was 45 years ago. I am strong. I am able. I can do it. Give me this opportunity. I will lead. I know what's going on. And everybody would have chosen Caleb, I think. But God chose Joshua, a man to whom he had to say three times in four lines of his calling, be strong and courageous because I will be with you. And we read about Caleb in a book that has the name of Joshua. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and in due time he will lift you up. That's what God is saying. What about the greatest missionary who ever lived? The man who wrote half the books of the New Testament. At one time, this was one of the proudest people on the face of the earth. He was a Pharisee, he said, of Pharisees. I was proud of my heritage. I was proud of my choice. I was proud of my life. I counted myself to be above reproach and righteous. He said, I was proud. And then and later, when he met Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul said, I have nothing to boast except that Jesus Christ died for me. That's the only thing I have to boast about. And in his very last days of his life, when he wrote these two letters to Timothy, his young preacher protege, when he wrote Timothy, he said to him, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. What about Simon Peter? You think Simon Peter was humble? You say, well, he didn't seem to me like he was. In, in some cases, he, uh, he was valiant and vacillating. He always acted twice and thought once. He was one of those people that was so sure of himself, and, and yet, hear the Simon Peter in 1 Peter 5, 5, and 6. Hear the Spirit-filled Simon Peter as he says, clothe yourselves with humility, all of you toward one another. And here it comes again, for God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and in due time, he will lift you up. And what about our Lord, Jesus, who emptied all of his divine prerogatives and became a man? In Philippians chapter 2 are listed seven demotions that Jesus Christ went through to save you and me. We talk a lot about upward mobility in our society and people are concerned about upward mobility. The Son of God, when he came, was about downward mobility. The Word says again and again in Philippians 2, things like he left the figure of a man or left the divine prerogative and he let go of everything that gave him divine prerogative. He emptied himself and became a man. He, he was a Son of God. He became a man. 
He humbled himself. He humbled himself even unto obeying God about his death. And that's not all. The last emotion was the hardest of all. He died even the death of the cross, the humiliating, criminal's painful, shameful death of the cross for you and me. And what happened? Well, the Scripture in Philippians 2, after saying all of this, of all the seven times that Jesus took a step down for you and me and finally took a step all the way down to dying on a cross for you and me, the next line says, And therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up. That's the, that's the testimony of the incarnation. That's the example of our Lord Christ. He says, I want you to humble yourself, and I will exalt you. Trust me to do that. Have you ever thought about a definition for a sermon? I don't, I don't think I'd want to hear some of your definitions of a sermon. But my favorite definition of a sermon is a word from God, a message from God that ends with emotion. And today I'm going to end this sermon with emotion. I'm going to move that every one of us will say, Jesus Christ is my Lord. And in a few minutes, I'm going to ask you for a second. I'm going to ask someone to stand up and second this motion. Now, I haven't gotten this settled as far as planning someone to do it. If this doesn't get a second, we might as well lock up the doors and go home. And then I'm going to ask you all to stand and to say, Jesus Christ is my Lord. All right, let's call ourselves into that divine session. I move that we all declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Is there a second to that motion? Good. I want you to stand up and give the second. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. All right. Now let's all of us stand. And I want us to say it together. Jesus Christ is my Lord. Jesus Christ is my Lord. Again. Jesus Christ is my Lord. Again. Jesus Christ is my Lord. Amen. And remain standing, and we'll give you opportunity now to come and make the decision because Jesus Christ is your Lord that you need to make. Would you come even now?